I love BMWs. I grew up fixing them with my dad. I've owned two of them so far and I plan on owning many more. They are the pinnacle of performance driving. And this week on The Bestest, I'm covering every legendary BMW that has solidified the brand as a leader in automotive technology, design, and performance. The 328 Roadster, built between 1936 to 1940, kickstarted BMW's motorsport career by placing them on the cutting edge of innovation, styling, and performance. It was extremely advanced, sporting independent suspension and a sleek, lightweight body with integrated headlights. The first of its kind. Its two liter inline six engine was also quite advanced and helped the 328 Roadster take over 100 class wins. 100! It won the Mila Miglia with an average speed of 103 three miles per hour. It also took a class win at the RAC Tourist Trophy, as well as a class win at the 1939 24-hour of Le Mans. It's a highly recognized masterpiece and ranked among the top 25 cars of the 20th century. The 507 Roadster, built between 1956 and 1959, is considered the most collectible BMW ever made. That's because of its stunning looks, low production volume, and rich history of famous owners. It was popularized by some very famous people, including Elvis Presley, John Surtees, and Bernie Ecclestone, who sold his at auction in 2007 for close to $1 million. Let's make it a million. The idea for the 507 was conceived by BMW's exclusive US car importer, who wanted a Roadster to fill the gap between the more expensive Mercedes 300 SL and the cheaper MG sports cars of the time. The 507 came with BMW's first aluminum alloy, dual carbureted pushrod V8, previously used in the larger, equally elegant 502. Not many were sold, but its design cues inspired a BMW design philosophy that holds true even to this day. The 2002 Turbo is an entry-level BMW that is also beginning to sell for big bucks. It was one of the first production cars to use turbo technology and gave this light little two-door a healthy 170 horsepower. It quickly gained a reputation as a serious track weapon. Its perfectly balanced 50-50 weight distribution proved to be BMW's golden ratio. And the 2002 was even proving itself long before the Turbo even came out. In 1970, the 2002 won the Nürburgring 24 hours with the help of Honda. Stuck, who would become a legend for his sideways driving and yodeling while he crossed finish lines. So I guess BMW figured if they slapped a turbo on the 2002, anyone could be a Hans Stuck. But turbo technology was brand new. It made brutal top end power, but inhaled gasoline doing so. When the oil crisis hit a year later in 1974, BMW was forced to ditch their air induction technology. The BMW 3.0 CSL built between 1971 to 1979 marked BMW's return to international motorsports. Produced in low numbers only to meet homologation requirements for competition, its popularity spiked due to the success of its racing career. Nicknamed the Batmobile, it has strikingly large fenders and an oversized rear wing. Does it come in black? It's the coolest looking race car ever built and even took on the first two art car liveries BMW ever used. It dominated the European Touring Car Championship and even got a 1-2 finish at the German Touring Car Grand Prix at Nürburgring in 1973. It was doing great until it entered Group 5. In 1976, Group 5 tightened their rules to cater to production cars instead of prototypes. So BMW entered the CSL with a larger 3.5 liter engine. It did good, but not good enough. So the CSL was replaced with a smaller, more nimble car that would go on to make BMW history and mark the beginning of BMW BMW's longest running line of sports cars. The E21 BMW is the first generation of a long running line of 3 Series BMWs, a car we love and a video you should check out regarding its evolution. It was also a perfect candidate for Group 5. In just 12 weeks, BMW replaced the CSL with the 320 Turbo Group 5 race car with even bigger fender flares and an even bigger wing weighing in at a much lighter 1600 pounds. I did the maths. Its M12 engine was taken from BMW's successful Formula 2 cars, a 2-liter inline 4 making 300 horsepower. And it wasn't just the car that was spectacular, it was the drivers as well. The first junior driving program ever created entered the German Touring Car Championships in 1977 with the 320 Turbo. In the USA, the car was lacking power to keep up with the Porsche 935s and 934s. The car needed more power, so BMW teamed up with McLaren of North America to do just that, pumping 
pulling out up to 650 horsepower from the little two liter. Quickly labeled as the Flying Brick, it won seven races between 1977 and 1978. But the Porsches still put up a good fight, so BMW again went back to the drawing board. In comes BMW's very first M car, the M1. A mid-engine supercar that was a brand new concept for the brand and subsequently turned into a nightmare to manufacture. It was designed by Lamborghini, but Lamborghini was going broke, so BMW had to pull the plug on them. By the time they got all the parts sourced and assembled together, Group 5 was dismantled. So BMW was like, I guess we'll just have to make our own race. So was born the Pro Car Series and perhaps what saved the M1 from becoming completely useless. However, its engine was anything but useless. It was developed by engine guru Paul Roche, the same guy responsible for the McLaren F1's golden V12 engine. Paul took the notorious inline six from the 3.5 CSL and gave it individual throttle bodies and four valves per cylinder, a top end recipe that would stay true to almost every M car after it. And once they strapped a turbo to that beast, it made an incredible 850 horsepower. But the mid-engine supercar layout just wasn't doing it for BMW. Using everything they've learned from the M1, they created one of the most incredible sports car models in history. In comes the first M3, the Wolf, model code E30, the follow-up to the BMW 320 Turbo. By now, racing regulations were changing every year. BMW knew they could build race cars quickly and win races, but the reason they ditched the 320 was because of its reliability. But now, Paul Roche cracked the code and had reliable power on tap, so he designed a smaller, powerful four-cylinder with the engine code S14. Because the street cars had to resemble the race cars aerodynamically and by engine size, BMW made the Evo 1, the Evo 2, and the Sport Evolution. By 1989, they were making 295 horsepower stock. The E30 has won more races than any other model and is considered one of the most successful race cars of all time. In the mid 90s, something special happened, the McLaren F1. It was a huge success, taking home victories in a race BMW had never won, the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Since my boy Paul was responsible for its incredible engine, BMW jumped on the opportunity to feature it in a prototype race car in hopes of taking home the overall title. With the help of Williams, they designed a prototype chassis that would become the benchmark for many prototypes that followed. The BMW V12 LMR utilized a single roll hoop and a raised footbox something never seen before. And its engine in its newly modified format proved to be very quick, giving the BMW LMR its first and only win to date at the most grueling event in motorsports. Its success led to BMW's partnership as a V10 engine supplier for Williams F1 beginning in the year 2000. Shortly after their success at Le Mans, BMW introduced the holy grail of M3s, model code E46. It would be another chance for BMW to take on the mighty Porsche 911s that were once again dominating the field. Although the car outhandled the competition, its robust inline six cylinder engine was lacking the power to keep up around the track. So BMW made 10 special edition M3s with a powerful, lightweight V8. I like V8s. <laughs> The E46 M3 GTR, quite possibly the greatest M3 ever made. Let's put this all in perspective. Porsche has been BMW's chief rival since day one, and the 911 is the most widely used and most successful car in motorsport history. In the American Le Mans series, Porsche outnumbered BMW four to one. When the M3 GTR showed up a year later in 2001, the GTR knocked the pants off of Porsche, winning six out of eight races and taking home the manufacturer's championship title. Nowadays, the GT category is starting to look a lot like a supercar race. Cars are becoming longer, wider, and much more powerful. BMW once again needs to introduce a car that can keep up with the Porsche 911s. First, they had success with the Z4, then the M6, and now they're moving on to a brand new M8. The M8 GTE could be BMW's answer to a race-winning supercar they've always longed for, ever since the M1. This could be the next legendary car that puts BMW back on top. If if not, you can rest assured that they'll be back in no time with something even better. Make sure you hit that subscribe button if you like this video so we can keep bringing you more amazing content. Follow me on IG at Secret Skills. Follow Donut on IG at Donut Media. Support us by picking up some t-shirts and stickers at shop.donut.media. If you love the M3 just like me, go ahead and check out this up to speed about the M3. If you want to learn more about turbos, check out this episode of Science Garage. Are you a Beamer fan? Because by now, you should be. So let us know in the comments and I'll see you next week.